Well, good morning, Coastline Gulf Breeze. Uh, uh, again, I, I come with warm greetings from a neighboring coastline down the road in Navari. You know, if you're a tourist, that's what they call us, Navari. It's always, uh, it's always an honor. It's always a privilege to be back here. This is, as Neil said, my, my home church. Uh, this was the sending church along with Coastline Destin, who sent Don and I down to plant Coastline Navarre. And for those of you who are new to the church, I, I want to share just a little bit about my story before jumping in, because it does tie into, it does tie into the message. Uh, I am a son of a son of a son of a local, uh, like John and, and Neil. We're rare breeds here in these parts. Born in Pensacola, raised in the Gulf Breeze Midway area. Uh, I was this wild, crazy surfer, just uh, drugging and just alcohol uh, since I was nine years old, really. Um, I got saved at a, a church event that this church put on on Pensacola Beach. And God just, just did this radical work. Uh, he used this church. At that time, it was called New Life Church, this little, little building back in the woods because there were no subdivisions around at the time. And uh, man, he, he, he used this radical church starting in 1991 to grow me up to be a man of God. Uh, there was a, a youth pastor, Roger Jan, who poured into me, an elder, Roger Kraft, who poured into me, discipled me. Uh, it was amazing. This church was about 125, 150 people at the time, if you can imagine that. And uh, Neil was just a little tyke. He was just a, a little boy running around. And I had the privilege of sitting under John, Pastor John's teaching twice a week, Wednesdays and Sundays, Old Testament uh, Wednesdays, New Testament on Sundays for two decades. And, uh, and it was just what a blessing. You take that for granted. You don't realize how important it is. And it's not being done until you get out and look around after you've been a part of something so amazing. Uh, so after Bible college, I came back. I was an intern youth pastor here for just a short stint. And that was 1995, 96, right when Joe Pastor Joe was coming on, I believe, and, uh, and I had no idea. I just had no idea what the Lord was teaching me, what he was preparing me to do at that time. It's clear now, looking back, it's clear, clear, clear now, looking back, that, that God had this purpose and a plan, that it was his calling, his way, and his glory. His calling, his way, and his glory. John, Pastor John, married me and Don right down here sometime, back in 1998. We both served on staff here in multiple capacities. My wife for a little over five years, myself for about 10 years. We had three boys, Evan, Carter, and Jake. Three little boys. Evan's here with us. My oldest is 16 now. And uh, that, that, that's an old picture. It's a, they're two years older than that now. I can learn from Neil. He's got a family photo for every week. I, I don't... <laughs> I couldn't find one for two years. So if you remember this from last year, yeah. Uh, dedicated all three boys here in this, in this church. Watch my dad surrender his life to the Lord here. Watch him fall in love with my, my mom again. It's a beautiful thing. The importance of church being involved and plugging in like what Neil was saying. You take it for granted. It's beautiful. Watching and seeing what God has done. And so for this reason, I repeat, I am honored to share with you today. So thank you so much for receiving me. Title of my message, not fooling around, okay? God doesn't fool around. The, the passage, as Neil already said, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, before we jump into the word, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in Jesus' name, we bow our hearts to you. And Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that you don't fool around with the most precious things, this life you've given us. Thank you that you don't fool around when you call us. Lord, you have a perfect way for us. Lord, to your glory, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your work, your calling, your ways that are beyond ours. Lord, would you, would you meet us where we are, bring conviction and encouragement where it's needed today for each one of us. 
May my words fall by the wayside. May your word ring powerfully true by your spirit today. We give you this time. Direct our steps in this study in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please have a seat, guys. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, and it reads for, you see your calling, brethren, and I'm reading from the New King James in case you're wondering. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world. And the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the thing, things that are. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ. You are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, the righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So not the most flattering uh, passage of scripture for someone who, who places great pride in their own ability and their, places great security in, their, in themselves and their own physical or their own spiritual abilities. Not a flattering passage at all. Let me give you some, some context to the passage before we move into, uh, into the more of an interpret, uh, interpret, uh, interpreting it. The entire book of 1 Corinthians, it seems to deal with problems, problems and issues that had risen within the Corinthian church, issues pertaining to the culture and how to deal with the culture, the law, with, with theology. And he hits the gamut of topics through this, through this amazing book. But Paul doesn't fool around either. I mean, he jumps right into the thick of it in chapter one. Not a lot of niceties. Let's get right to the issues. Let's get right to the problem. And, uh, and the first major problem that Paul deals with in this book is humanism. It's a problem that we deal with today. It's humanism. Humanism is, is an outlook or a system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. It's looking to ourselves. It's, it's looking to man. It's trusting in man. It's leaning on man. And he tackles it right off the get-go. They were elevating and praising human leaders within the church. Cause and division. We read that in verses 10 through 17. Someone say, hey, I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, Cephas. I'm of Paul. Paul even attacks his own fans here. Like, hey, back off. The focus was on man and not not the Lord. But next, besides elevating human leaders, they were exalting human wisdom, human thinking. And this, this brings and holds the context of our passage this morning. And Paul contrasts, he compares the egocentric wisdom of people with the eternal wisdom of God. And Paul preached Christ Jesus crucified. And to the Jewish unbelievers, well, this was a stumbling block. They, they tripped over it. They just couldn't see how their Messiah, our, our Messiah would never be disgraced or lowly as to die upon a cross, they would say. They would stumble. But to the Greek unbelievers, the gospel, it was foolishness. They just could not, they just would not depend upon wisdom outside of the reach of man, outside of their own prowess, the mankind's prowess. They could not do that. So it was, was foolishness. But for the Jews and the Greeks who were called and who responded, verse 24, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Why? He says that no flesh should glory, verse 29, no flesh should boast. And that Man should glory in the Lord, verse 33. So let's tackle his calling. Verse 26, he reads, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Paul says, hey, there's not many wise, not many noble, not many, not, not many mighty call. Th this was intended to be a rather humbling kind of approach to this Corinthian church. 
This, this church, if you've studied it in, in, in any length, they thought really more highly of themselves than they should have. Hey, we're more spiritual than the rest. We have these giftings, and you know, they, they, they thought of themselves more highly than they should have. And Paul is saying, hey, you're, you're not such a great bargain. You're, you're not such a great bargain here. There were not many amongst them that were wise according to their, to their flesh, according to their own ability. There were not many mighty. There were not many noble among the Christian church there in Corinth. Corinth was kind of second to Rome and other, and they wanted to be more. Well, although there may have been some smart, there may have been some strong, even wealthy in the church. There, there may have, have been. There weren't too many of them. <laughs> there weren't too many of them. And I could probably say the same for here, right, and those watching, right? Probably not too many of you guys uh, out, out there. But even the wise, mighty, and noble realized their lowliness in the presence of Almighty God. And they answered that calling. Because it's a calling and his invitation into this relationship with him, into this, this amazing church that he has, has put together, he has created. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I find this super comforting that it's his calling, right? That he's called me and you. Not, not the wisest or the most mighty or the most noble. He chose fishermen. You know, he chose the least so often. It was amazing. Let me say, I, I am so amazed with the reality of God's calling. The reality of it. No human truly invited you uh, to faith in Jesus Christ. No human truly did this. Right, God may have been using someone God, God may have, have used a person to, to speak through, right? To come alongside of you, but really, it wasn't that person. It's the Spirit of God, the person of Jesus who called you. Jesus said he, he was going to send his comforter. He was going to be in the world. He was going to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And so the Holy Spirit is working, stirring as uh, as. We may hear it come from somebody else's mouth or a preacher on TV or, you know, but, but yet it's, it's God's calling. He is, he is wooing and drawing and coming alongside. Now, I was a, I was a drunkard. I was a, was a druggie and I didn't go to church. I didn't even know one solid Christian. I did not have a relationship with one solid. I had some guys who called themselves Christians, but they were as wild as I was and partied and, and just you know, I don't believe that they were saved. I didn't know one Christian. And the Lord, he called me by name. Oh, he used a surf movie. <laughs> kind of reeled me in. <laughs> Free surf movie. Size as a serpent, gentle as a dove. He used all kinds of things in my life to woo me, draw me. I couldn't run from him. Where I'd go, there you'd be. He would be, he would be calling me to himself. Such a beautiful God, isn't it? That he calls us by name. He knows us all. He knows where we are. Not a, not a one size fits all when it comes to sharing the gospel with someone because the Holy Spirit knows the size they are, right? And he begins to minister. Such a beautiful reality. You know, I, I'm meeting and talking with unbelievers all the time at the gym the gym I work out with. At. And, uh, and I'm, I'm meeting these guys, they're, they're unbelievers, and uh, they find out I'm a pastor, and then they start to, and then they, then they start cussing and stuff, but like, you know, and then, um, and so, which I'm, you know, okay. Um, and so they find, they, 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 they immediately, st I've been hearing this recently, I don't know if you guys have been hearing this, but even in the world, the unbelievers, they're, they're, there's something happening. I mean, these unbelievers are telling me, yeah, I'm not a believer, so I just want you to know. So I'm not a believer. And I love that. Be honest, be real. Like, you know, 
But I'm going to tell you, man, this is the end times. I'm like, well, how do you know it's the end times? Well, because the, that Bible, there's something true about it. There's something, it's, something's happening. Like, you know, something's happening. And I'm, I'm like, really? You know, and it, what's going on? It's the Holy Spirit. And it, something's happening in the world right now that, that he's shaking, he's stirring, right? And even the unbeliever is kind of scratching their head and going, what's going on? What's happening in the world? What's happening in our country? What, what's happening? And it's causing, it's the Lord stirring them, wooing them, drawing them. I love that. It's his calling. It's his calling. God calls us by name in powerful ways, and if we listen, <laughs> well, our eternity's rocked. It's changed. Because really, eternity's at stake. Now, I like what John Allen of the Salvation Army said on his deathbed. He said, I deserve to be damned. I deserve to be in hell, but God interfered. <laughs> Isn't that so true? Thank the Lord that he interferes with our trajectory to hell. Pastor John once said years and years ago, he said, you know, Jesus Christ ruined my life to the world. He said that. He ruined my life to the world. I can never enjoy the things of the world like I used to because I've partaken of these heavenly things that are eternal, you know? Thank you, Lord, for ruining and for interfering with our trajectory to hell, right? And what does the Lord do with those he calls? <laughs> Spectacular things. The Lord, is, he's an artist and he's an engineer, okay? You don't need to see those two mixing, right? He's an artist and an engineer in how he orchestrates everything going on in this world and for every person that he loves so dearly that he died for. His ways, his ways. But, but verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world. And the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Yet God chooses his working, his orchestrating, his engineering. God chooses the, the foolish, the weak, the lowly things of the world to do spectacular things. And when you look back through the biblical history, you, you find this. God's ways just are not our ways. I'm only going to give you a few. I could go on and on and on. But in Genesis chapter 6, God saved all humanity using a boat. A boat. I mean, a big boat, but, but all humanity and, and you know, and every, of every kind of species except for the, uh, the, the rhinopossumus. They didn't say that when they acted up, um, and so we don't have those around anymore. And... Uh, no, not really. That's not in the Bible. That's a Randy. That's a far side thing. But yeah, um, for you guys who remember that. But, but he used an ark. I mean, he could have done all kinds of things, but he used, a, he used an ark, a simple boat. Joshua, chapter 5, he used simple musical instruments, trumpets, to bring Jericho's walls down. He could have done it in so many different ways. Trumpets? What? Judges 7, he, he reduced Gideon's army from 32,000, which was still a small number compared to their enemy, reduces them down to 300, and the 300 sent the army of the Midianites running. Like, that's God's ways. That's how he does it. It's amazing. Hey, in Judges chapter 15, the Lord used one man, Samson, to defeat an entire Philistine army with a donkey's jawbone? Was there no other tool? Like, no other instrument? But a jaw? Okay. Because it didn't matter what instrument it was because it was the God, his God, who, who gave him victory. That's the idea. And finally, Jesus, he fed 5,000 plus, more than 5,000 people with, uh, with nothing more than, than a few loaves and fishes. I mean, come on, he's God. He could have rained manna down from heaven. He did that for 40 years. He could have uh, quail. Let's have a little meat, some quail in there. You know, but, but no, he, he took these, these few fish and, and, and loaves and he fed these multitudes. Why? Because the Lord specializes in using a little to accomplish a lot. That's what he does. And that's comforting to me. Thank you, Lord. 
Now, I recall hearing Pastor Chuck, he's the founder of Calvary Chapels, if you're not familiar. I heard him tell a story once in one of his teachings, and it was about a government official who came and met with him. And if you guys know where this is in any of the tracks, any of the, his teaching series, please let me know. I've been looking for it the last couple of years because um, he's got so many. Um, but he was telling the story of this government official who came in. He was perplexed. He said, how are you doing what you're doing? Like, what, these hippies, they had, they had checked out, man. They, they checked out on, on life and society. They checked out on everything, chasing after this, this kind of whimsical mirage of, of happiness and pleasure. And, and, and it left them just reeling and spinning, spun out. They weren't contributing to society they were just existing for their own pleasure. And, and all of a sudden, this Jesus movement takes place. And I believe this official came, it's either at the zenith or towards the end of the Jesus movement in the late 70s, early 80s. And, and he was like, how have you done this? These, these were hippies, and now they're, they, they're, man, they're raising families. They're, they're paying their taxes. They're going to, they're going to college. They're getting educations. What are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And you know, Chuck is so humble, he just kind of, well, you know, I just am teaching the Bible simply and loving on them. You know, <laughs> teaching, the, loving on them. <laughs> this kind of wisdom, it, it, it brings shame. It brings shame to the lofty wisdom of man. Man's wisdom, it consists of complex programs extensive education, expensive medication. But the Lord simply asks us to know him. Watch what will happen. His ways are amazing. His calling, his ways. Just to know him, to know our caller, to trust in him, and to seek him with our life. One of, one of my spiritual fathers he poured into me. He was a Vietnam vet who overdosed on heroin while out on patrol in, in Vietnam. And uh, it's a bad thing to do. They thought he, he died. He just nodded out. They thought he, they left him behind. Um, he tells, it's an amazing story how he comes to and, and how dark it was and how God spared his life. Amazing story. And, and he makes it stateside. He gives his life to, to Jesus, surrenders his life to the Lord, and, uh, and after that pursues an education and then became an engineer, became one of the greatest engineers along this coast. Amazing story. He, he, he struggled with PTSD. He struggled. He dealt with so much with, with Vietnam, and, and uh, it was pretty bad for him. He'll probably always struggle with it, but, but something amazing happened to him. He was on a mission trip with this church some 30 years ago, and he was in, down in Haiti, and he... He was out, he was doing a water project as an engineer, that's what he was doing, and he was in rice paddies. And he was in the middle of all these rice paddies, they grow rice down there, and, and, and he was thinking through a water project. And all of a sudden, uh, everyone started running around him and they were all speaking a language he didn't understand, and then helicopters started flying over. Well, I mean, it just kind of brought him right back, you know? Like, everything kind of came full circle uh, to him. Now, the whole experience of Vietnam flooded him and so did all the anxieties with it. And he was losing his mind. And the Lord met him right there on that mission trip. Met him there. And there God's peace came over him like a flood and he experienced healing that day from the Lord Jesus. <laughs> the Lord, he often places his children on the proverbial couch of counsel. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, do they still do that? You know, lay down on the couch and where were you as a child? Do they still do that? I don't know if they do that. Yeah, do it standing up probably now, right? Well, well, God does that with us, with his children. He allows things in life that are lowly and despised and terrible things and, and he, he uses them in powerful ways to minister to us. It makes the wise scratch their head. It's really beautiful, isn't it? How God deals with us so beautifully. He allows pains and he allows events in life, struggles to happen that bring to the surface things that need to surface and then he ministers to us by his spirit through the word. 
sometimes by us, the church, right? Counsel and healing through the most unusual means. And let me share just a little personal story along those lines, God's wisdom, God's ways that are beyond ours and, and really could make the most wise of man scratch his head. I was 29, I was diagnosed with Kimbox disease in my right hand. And um, I, was, uh, I, was, uh, I was really big then. I was big, I was a power lifter, and I was working with my hands. I was a surfer, mountain, mountain biking, and, um, and I was, the pain was just getting so crazy in my hand, and doctors finally diagnosed it. You have Kimbox disease, and you're probably gonna lose your right hand. So it was progressing, and um, well, I was 29. I was born without toes or heels, extreme club feet. And, uh, and so I've, I've hurt on my feet always, and so I've leaned on my upper body and that, you know, to, to kind of, you know, kind of carry me in a lot of ways, you know. Uh, and, and so this was a blow. This was a blow. But let me tell you the rest of the story. I, I left the ministry. I left the ministry here. I, I left my calling that God had called me to. I, I left it kind of pursuing um, a, a job that I felt more satisfying you know, you arrive to a problem, you have a solution to the problem, apply the solution, walk away, problem solved, and you get paid. You don't see that in ministry, right? And I, I love that. I love that, and, and I, lo I made lots of money doing it, too. Let's just say that. Um, and so, you know, it, it, and I left my calling. I left the Lord. And here I am, seven, fast forward, six, about six years, seven years later, bone disease in my hand. I have to stop my job. I have to... Uh, uh, we didn't use computers, so we wrote with our hands back then. Remember that? And, and so it was my right hand, right? I even had a stick shift truck. I mean, so I had to learn to do this. Thing. That's weird. But so, so yeah, and, and I was depressed. I was so depressed. You know, that job was my, um, was my ship to Tarshish. God said, go to Nineveh. And I said, how about Tarshish, you know? And I hopped on the, with this job, and I left. I, and then I started, started little by little pulling out of my ministries here, my commitments here. Pretty soon, I wasn't coming to a midweek service for a season. I was traveling. I was making money. I was bailing out on the Lord in every way I can. And this bone disease came, and it was like a, it was like a whale that swallowed me up off the ship. <sighs> swallowed me up. And in the belly of this Kimbox disease whale, I was depressed. I was suicidal. I was taking Oxycontin after the surgery and drinking on top of it, or a cast for 10 months. I transformed from a little miniature uh, Homer Simpson to, uh, I mean, to a, a Schwarzenegger to a Homer Simpson. I went, oh, like that, you know? And, and I was just, oh, I was depressed, and my wife was the breadwinner, and I was pacing up and down in my, in my house, and, I was, and I, was, uh, I was just, woe is me in it, you know? Uh, no feet problems, my hand problems. <laughs> Can I? And, uh, and God grabbed my shoulder and said, are you through? Are you done? Uh, I love you, Randy, and I've got a plan, and this is not it. You ready? I'm not fooling around. I've got, why don't you stop fooling around, right? I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir, where, where, where do you want me? You want me to go where I, I don't want to go and be a youth pastor? <laughs> I'm not good with kids. I, you know, but I'll do that, Lord. If that's what you want me to do, I'll, I'll do that. And I came here and I knocked on the door and I was expecting a, a you know, car, red carpet and a ring and a robe. And Joe said, well, parking ministry, you can help me with that. <laughs> and but God began to bring me back in and to minister to me and bring such healing and when I tell that story, God's wisdom, it eludes, it escapes some. When I say, I thank God for that bone disease, I thank God for it. Because he used that in such powerful ways to redirect me, to make my calling sure, to see that his ways are beyond my ways. If I would just trust him, lean on him. Mm. How can, how can God used terrible diseases and terrible events to bring about good. I have no idea, but he's God. And he does amazing things. He does all things, works all things out for the good towards those who love him and trust him. It's beautiful, really. He's a master worker, master engineer, orchestrator. Mm -mm -mm. That's how God uses weak 
and despise things of the world to bring shame to things that are mighty. He uses, he uses a, a balding old man named Chuck Smith who had never drank and never did drugs to reach a whole generation of drug-taking hippies. What? I've watched the Lord use a most likely never to succeed, not so smart man with lots of hang-ups to plant and pastor a growing healthy church in a military's backyard, a man who's never been in the military. I couldn't, I couldn't serve in the military because of my feet. I've watched God use this foolish thing of the world. It's truly humbling and equally exciting. I wake up sweating sometimes. Now when I I wake up thinking of my responsibilities as a lead pastor, 10 staff, this growing church, all these insecurities that that I have, this massive space constraint that we have down there. We have no space for a broom in that church. Like, we're only seven years old. I wake up stressing over it. It's a good problem, I know, but it's a problem. Right? And they have 20 kids in one little tiny little room. Little room, too. You know, 100 you know, elementary kids. Like, what the? God help us. Right? I stress out over it. I don't have answers. And I'm like, oh. And then God comforts me and reminds me that this is his church. It's his church, not mine. I'm answering his calling. And he loves to choose the weak and unlikely people without answers to accomplish his ways. I'm encouraged by that. (laughs) Oh, Randy, I love to use the weak and humble. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yeah, but it's, but it's, thank you, Lord. (laughs) God's ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Thank you, Lord. Whatever God may be using in your life today, know that he is an efficient God. It's a waste of anything. He doesn't fool around. He takes everything and he uses it efficiently. Lean on, trust in him, and do it with all of your being. Watch him use you. Watch him use the circumstances. Watch him use the circumstances to shame the wise around you and accomplish the most amazing things. And he'll do all this not only because he loves you greatly, but so that you and others will glory and boast in the Lord. His glory. His calling, his ways, his glory. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? (laughs) That, That no flesh should glory in his presence. I mean, this is, this is the end result of what God's doing in you and I. No one will, will stand before God and declare, hey, I figured you out. Hey, you did exactly what I thought you were going to do. Did you read my book, Lord? No, no, no one's going to, no one's going to say that. Mm-mm-mm. God's ways are greater and higher and nothing of this flesh will ever glory in his presence. Jesus brilliantly displays to us in his teaching and in his life that God's wisdom. I mean, Jesus became, we're told here, became for us wisdom. This wisdom is often in contradiction to man's expectations, to man's ways. Man says, there, there, there has to be another way. 
There has to be another way than this cross, this narrow-minded the viewpoint. There just has to be a, another way, but there isn't. But there isn't. There's no other way. And even Jesus, when he faced the cross in the garden, he saw it and he said, Father, is there any other way? Take this cup from me. There wasn't. Nevertheless, your will be done, Father. Your will be done. Wisdom concerning salvation. It isn't given to us by the Lord. Okay? Wisdom, it's not given. God doesn't say, hey, take this, do this, say three of these, and call me in the morning. Right? No, he doesn't say that. Yeah, that's not the answer. That's not, that's not wisdom. No, wisdom is in the Lord. Are you seeing the difference? It's not coming from the Lord. It's in the Lord. Right? People come to me for answers, for counseling. And really, I don't have the answers in counseling. I point them to the one who does. Right? There's the answer. The wisdom is in him. It's in Christ Jesus. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus to the glory of God through us, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and everything that we could ever need or want, you know where it's found? In Christ Jesus. Everything. The foolishness of the cross has brought glorious results to everyone who will believe. Jesus doesn't show us the way. He is the way. Jesus doesn't grant us eternal life. Bless you, my son, now you have eternal life. No, he is eternal life. And in him, we have it. He is eternal life for all of us who are found in Christ Jesus, we're told here in this passage. And we glory and we boast in the Lord alone. Stand with me if you will. Paul knew that, that, that drawing the church's attention, he's about to go into all these problems, all these issues, he's going to unfold them one by one, they're going to unravel, he's going to directly get involved, and, but, but he wanted to start this whole thing, he wanted to draw the church's attention, and I want to draw your attention today to this, this he wanted to, to draw their attention to the calling, his calling, his ways, his glory. His calling, his ways, his glory could have a powerful effect on them if they listen, if they'll receive it. And that goes the same for me and you today. If they would allow, the Lord could call them, well, call them from their problems. He could direct them through their troubles and to his glory. We can do the same for you and I today. May we listen closely to his daily calling. May we, may we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and expect him to lift us up and exalt us in due time. That's his way. It's powerful. It's beautiful. May we look at the weak people and those least among us. And may we not see limitations, but instead see the Lord's possibilities in them. Do that with your children as well. The Lord's possibility in them. And pray that they receive that. And finally, may we do all things for the glory of our Lord, knowing that we are greatly loved. We are greatly loved. God may use a fool, but he's not fooling around. 